Bone. I'm the executive director of the Palace of Fertis Peninsula Land Conservancy, and um, we welcome you all here this morning. We're so grateful that you're here spending some time with us and, um, and experiencing the release of, a, of an endangered species. It's a really special occasion, so thank you all. Um, a little bit about this space. This is the Lyndon H. Chandler Preserve, and it was donated to the Land Conservancy and the City of Rolling Hills Estates by the Chandler family. It was a, a formerly um, a farm site at one point, and it, it was the Chandler Sand and Gravel Company family that um, dedicated and donated this land. And so part of the model of the Conservancy and our values in working with willing sellers and willing donors, this land was acquired for preservation. Um, about 28 and, a half, eight, 28 and one half acres is the size of the space. And as you can see, it's a great community asset. Um, earlier this morning, we had trail runners and dog walkers, and we'll see horses as well um, through here. So it's wonderful. The Conservancy's um, spent time over the since the dedication in 94 to restore the Willow Creek areas here and the slopes with coastal sage scrub, and also restore um, for the Palace Verde's Blue Butterfly, which has two specific food plants that it needs to um, oviposit on and to continue its life cycle. So um, those plants are grown in our native plant nursery and we outplant them here on the restoration project. Starting about 30 years ago, and for a period of 10 years, I thought I was the last person to see a Palace Verde Blue Butterfly in the wild. In 1982, we ran our first count. We found six locations, two of them in the originally describing, described paper, uh, and four new locations. And we thought, hey, this is pretty good. Maybe these butterflies have a better chance than we thought they did. That changed very quickly. In the summer of 1982, the city of Rancho Palos Verdes put in a baseball diamond right on top of the habitat for the Palos Verdes blue butterfly it has park. With plenty of room for a baseball diamond, several baseball diamonds in that park, if they had not parked it on top of the butterfly habitat, those butterflies might still be there. That population disappeared. In 1983, we went looking for those butterflies, bringing the same experts down to come do a February census of what the butterflies were doing and none of those six locations turned up a single butterfly. In March I found a new location with one weekend three butterflies and the next weekend another three butterflies. I got some photographs. Uh, they might have been the same three butterflies, perhaps might have been as many as six butterflies, but there weren't many at that one location. And that was last anybody saw the butterflies on the south side of the peninsula until much later. Uh, but when you open this up, you can find the Palos Verdes blue butterfly, and it is listed as extinct. And I, I bring that to emphasize to you where this species has been. For 11 years, you guys did an awesome job of trying to find it somewhere, and it was nowhere. Um, it remained on uh, the Endangered Species Act list because um, absence of evidence does not equal evidence of absence. And so you always suspect that it could be somewhere else that you're just not looking in the right place. The one place on the peninsula that they could not go was the military base because it's a military base. <laughs> and what allowed them to actually get access to the military base was the Chevron pipeline and they had to do an environmental impact report. And it was amazing because Rick did ID a population that was unknown. And at that time, the estimate of that population was 65. So today, as you look at these butterflies, realize that there were 11 years that they thought there were none. And when it was rediscovered, it was a population of 65. That's tiny. That's hanging on by a fingernail. For 10 years after it was rediscovered, we hovered around 200 in the wild and around 200 in captivity. And we tried some new things, and in that one season, with the new things being tried only on 18 females, we were able to take the population from 186 in captivity to 700. And that was such a glorious rearing experience. And with 700, that meant that we could divide them into two groups of 350, and I needed a second site. 
and it's been a great collaboration between the Urban Wildlands Group and Moore Park College. And that first season I had about a dozen interns and 350 bugs and we bred them and used new methods and we had 4,513. There were bugs everywhere. <laughs> it was insane. And we didn't know what to do with them because we had so many of them. So we hit those 4,513 and we're like, well, what do you do with them? And that's where the strength of the relationship is with PVPLC. Not only do they provide us with our food plants to feed all of our progeny, but this is the reason that those bugs are not going to die in those containers. They get to fly free and they get to fly free today and the person who's going to give them their freedom is you and you and you. Each one of you will have your own container. You will open it up and it will fly free for the first time in its life. Thank you. 